My name is Sandro. I'm a software craftsman. I work for UBS Investment Bank. I write code every day, and I'm also a director there. And I'm also the founder of the London Software Craftsmanship Community, that is currently the largest craftsmanship community in the world, with 1,300 uh, members. So, this talk is about, well, it started with this idea, right? It's quite big, isn't it? Uh, like, yeah, so people, when, when the whole craftsmanship movement started, people say, yeah, all these guys, they just care about their beautiful coat, right? Yeah, the crafted thing. They don't have the big vision. They don't understand the process, right? Uh, so, oh yeah, that's here. That's our first shot, right? So that's bullshit. But before I start talking about uh, software craftsmanship, I need to go to give some context as well. Uh, so, basically what happened was, how many of you have seen this before? Yeah, just half of you. It's, it's funny, like when a rumor, everyone uses Agile, but, and that, that's repeated in many different conferences, that just half have seen the manifesto before. Uh, so basically, uh, in 2001, uh, 17 people in a skiing resort in Utah, they met uh, to discuss alternatives to uh, heavyweight, document-based uh, methodologies. And they were trying different things. They were people trying the XP, Scrum, DSTM, Crystal, feature-driven development, the Prague Prog. So Jeff Sutherland was there. So Martin Fowler, Ward Cunningham, Kent Beck, uh, Uncle Bob. Uh, so all these guys, Brian Merrick. So if you don't know who some of these guys are, you probably should. So Google them. Google who was in the, the, the Agile Summit. Look at their materials. Look where the ideas that we are discussing here today, the ideas that we use today, understand where they came from, why they were created. So, so in this Agile Summit, they shared loads of ideas and they came up with this beautiful manifesto. To, to be honest with you, I think that this is extremely well written. I absolutely adore the Agile Manifesto. And then, at that time, the Agile Alliance was formed and then, uh, Everything, then all the conferences started, agile conferences everywhere, and everyone was spreading the word. And then the companies went mad. It's like, oh, you, I don't know what it is, but everyone's talking about, I want a little bit of that. I want this, this scrum thing, I want a bit of that. And then Lean came along, I want a bit of that. And then everyone wanted all of these things. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Uh, so everyone was having stand-up meetings, and then burn down charts, and then product, uh, product backlog, iteration backlogs, release backlog, and then agile coaches, with many of you, they were all over the place. There are more agile coaches and developers and managers. And then iterations, user stories, and all this kind of good stuff. And then, of course, right, they went that in. Post-its. Post-its everywhere. That's how you measure agility. Right, the more post-its you have, the more agile you are. And of course, they need to be colorful, right? They need to be colorful post-its because that's the measure of true agility. And as soon as you have colorful post-its, then you are a master Pokemon super agile guru. <laughs> so, and then we spent uh, 10 years uh, talking about that. Process, uh, interactions, people, team building, uh, ecosystem, and then reducing waste. And, all important problems, problems that had to be addressed, because if you don't address them, you won't get anywhere. So the only problem is that at some point, Agile took a detour, because Agile was an umbrella of practices and methodologies. But at some point, because it was far easier to say, oh, just go there, tell people what you do, you have a few stand-up meetings there, you have a retrospective, I'll just tell you what you do, you don't do stuff. So, Agile took a detour, and then process became more important than the technical practices. And I was part of that. I, w I worked for, for a software consultancy company where we were doing loads of these agile transformation. And now I work for a very large investment bank with teams all over the world. Uh, and the effect was the same. So we've seen that happening many, many times before. So they went, everyone went crazy on the post-it party, right? And then, yeah, awesome, agile. And then, after three years later, they wake up and say, like, fucking hell, another drink. Uh, we, we, we are as rubbish as we were before. The only difference now is that every two weeks, we see the pile of shit getting bigger. Right? And then we say, wow, this week we did well. Look, just this amount of shit was added. Well, this, we this week we just fucked up. Like, look at the pile of shit now. It's almost doubled. So that, that's what happened. Right? And and then, like, oh, I was working with this guy, developer, agile team, right? 
So I joined the project and, and I, I wanted to pair with someone, so I sat down uh, and I said, well, can I pair with you? With you? And then he said, yeah, sure, of course. And then I asked him to explain. That was a brand new feature, by the way. And, and then he was saying, oh, I need to do that. Those are the requirements. So I was like, cool. And then I started looking at the code and then he started explaining to me. And I said, but why do you need that? Ah, oh, yeah, and I, I don't know. Uh, it's just there for now. Uh, but let, let's, let's go for it. So, okay. And I said, well, but what about your, these names? I can't see how it correlates to the requirements. Yeah, I know, I spent like three hours already, so I'm almost done with that, so it's, can I just get on? So, yeah, but there's lots of duplication and stuff, and so, you know what, I know what to do. As it's almost done now, let's add that to the technical backlog, uh, technical debt backlog. That's the, ca the, the technical debt backlog is that bucket of shit that you just shove this stuff in there and never remove. And that was a brand new feature in an Agile team. And the guy was writing the software, already thinking to add stuff to technical backlog. And that's what I call, because like, lean people love the Toyota story that was mentioned many times before. Yeah, we need to optimize the production line and reduce waste. That's all awesome. We are producing all these cars, going straight to the, the clients. Awesome. And they are all shit. Can you imagine if all the cars were shit? If as soon as they get to the customer, they, the customers hate it, they, need, they break down all the time, they need to take the garage all the time, because the quality sucks. And then over the time, they need to do the maintenance, like something goes wrong, a bulb uh, goes off, they need to remove the engine to replace the, 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 the bulb. So that doesn't make sense, so they were also interested in the quality. And so, but then of course you can say that, well, but it's a bit unfair, like, you come here, say that we just do shit. Right, so, like we have pressure, right? So if people are pressuring to deliver. Yeah, of course, uh, the bad news is that that won't change. It doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter which company you work for, you always have some pressure. And under pressure, what we do, we cut corners, uh, normally. And, but of course, that you can say like, no one wakes up in the morning and say like, today I'm gonna screw up. Today I'm gonna write the worst code that I can possibly write. I'm gonna fuck up with this company. I met some people that did that, but normal people don't do that, <laughs> right? Normal people don't do. So everyone is trying to do a good job, but there's always a pressure in there. But I realized that in a true agile uh, environment, and I believe that, I like to believe that many of us are in a true agile environment, and what I mean by that is that we will have a product owner with a prioritized backlog. So it sounds a bit utopic, but, but normally, like I met many people that are in this situation, and we are. Uh, and then what they do? They come to us, the business, say, okay, that's your list, that's your priority list. And they will ask us developers to say how long things are going to take. And I realized that we have the wrong notion of time because the pressure that we keep talking about, we put on ourselves. We think that we don't have time. And what we do is say, oh yeah, for this task, I need a few hours to do this uh, service, create a table in the database, adjust the screen, and then do some manual testing. But very rarely we say like, is my system prepared to receive this new feature? Can I spend some time preparing my system so I can just take the new feature and just slide it in nicely? We don't do that because we think we don't have time. Even when we have the power to go to the business and tell them how long something is gonna take. And I remember working with this guy. Uh, I could go on forever with these stories, but uh, I'm working with this guy and then uh, he was, when I when I asked, asked to pair with him and then he said, sure. And then he was packaging the, the system, copying to a UAT environment. And then he, uh, we were working on enterprise systems, so he was, we didn't have screens, so we was just placing some messages in a queue and then looking at the logs, looking at the logs. And then, oh, put another message in the queue, looking at the logs. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where the bug is. And so, right, why don't you do that in your local machine? Ah, no, I can't run the system in a local machine. Too many dependents. Right. Why don't you run your tests to try to replicate? Ah, no, it will take too long. And then he said, hey, I can't find it. So he went back to his machine, add more print statements package, copied across, deployed, played the message in, looking at the logs. Ah, I think that that is. That was like two hours later. And then he went to the code and said, I think that is because of my print statements, one, two, three, four, in the skip to seven. 
So I think that that's the block. Copy it across. Uh, I don't need this block, so remove it. Put a global variable here. Uh, skip that, and then done. Package, copy it across, deploy it, run it with the logs. OK, that's right. Come back, remove all the print statements, package, deploy, copy it across. Because, and that was three hours later, because he doesn't have time to test, to write a unit test, to make it run locally. And imagine that he was one out of 50 that we have in five countries. Right, so right, five countries another project, but we have 15 two countries in this project, that was this case. So imagine 50 people doing the same. And then now that he put this bloody global variable in there, the next developer will take far longer, just because we don't have time. And on top of all that, is there any QA people in the room? Right, these guys don't have anything to do with their lives, right? So there are a bunch of lazy people that we developers say, ah, take the code, find a buggy then for me, right? So because they, we are too busy. But I tell you what, how I feel about QA. Every time that they find a bug, I feel embarrassed. Because that when QA finds a bug, is because I haven't done my job properly. They should find nothing, zero, nada. If they were paid by bugs that they find, they would starve to death. Right? You know that a, a company, that, uh, a visa telecom company, they had these, I wouldn't say that, but uh, just this one. Uh, and, and, and there was this big event, like every six months they have the come and talk to your CTO, whatever the hell it was. And then this guy was like saying, now I want to uh, have a round of applause to our QA team that was shared across many different projects. They found like, it was a stupid number, like 1,000 bugs across the entire department and stuff. And everyone was, wow, wow. I said, what sort of madness is this? Right? I would fire half of the company if it was the case. Right? No, they were happy, apparently. But, uh, 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 yeah. So I went on a tangent. So, but what is agile anyway? So for me, uh, yeah, like some guy said, like, you don't do agile. Agile is not a thing that you do. You can't do agile. Like you can be agile if you want to. So, how I see it is, for me, it's about quick and short feedback loop. The quickest and short, uh, shorter feedback loop I have, that's my uh, option to be agile, to react to this new information that I get, very often, very quickly. And that gives me the opportunity to react. And the act of reacting, for me, is the agility that we are looking for. So the problem that I see with the manifesto is the work in software. Because all that kind of, all that kind of pile of shit that we deal with, they're all work in software. They take forever to, to, to build. We take forever to go to production. Any feature takes two months. That's probably the, the default answer. How long is it going to take? Two months. So um, it, it's a pain in the ass to test. And that's all working software. And you guys can go along and say, talk about whatever you want, about all the process that you want. But once it was established that we need a software to solve our problem, once that was established, the most important deliverable in a software project is the software itself. So because uh, if the software is not well done, I'm not talking about, because oh, there's always these silly people that come to you and say, yeah, but what about a startup? I just want to write some crap code and test the market. Yeah, of course, it's different, right? But how often do we do that, right? So, of course, there is context involved in this conversation, right? You cannot just say, oh, we need perfect or crafted code, 100% tested all the time. Of course not. Like if you're just spiking, if you are a startup, just put a, a, a click counter on the page. Of course, you don't want to invest a lot. But normally, we need quality. And the reason being is because, once again, you can say whatever you want. The business can come with all the ideas to change the world. And then all the agile and lean people will help them to get there. But they will just go as fast as we can change the software. And then in 2008, some people, some of the, the people that were in the, the Agile uh, Summit in 2001, and a few other people that were really uh, annoyed with the whole process-focused thing. Um, so they said, okay, well, something went wrong somewhere. So let, let's talk about it. So they had a summit in Chicago in December, if I'm not wrong, in 2008. And then they brought 
the, the term software craftsmanship that was written in a book in 2001 by Peter McBreen and even mentioned before in the Prague Prox. So, and they created, they came up with this. So the first thing that they addressed was uh, working software, uh, not only working software, but also well-crafted. And by that, because there are loads of debates on this manifesto, loads, you take, you have talk to people, they say, oh yeah, that's shit, and la la la. We need to understand what, is, what, it, what it means. So what we mean by that is systems that we are not scared to touch. Like how many times we were in situations where we need to add a new feature and say, so, oh my God, <laughs> because I may break something, right? And, and so we don't have a clue. We look at the code and so fucking hell, who wrote that? Oh, it was me six months ago. So, <laughs> so we, we, we want good code that when you talk to our business analysts, or your BAs, our product owners, when we can see what they're talking about and we can ref see that in the code. Like I had weird conversations with uh, BAs and product owners where for them in their head, there were different parts of the systems because they talk. Like there is this part and we do that and there were this, which, but then we were fixing one part and breaking the other. And so like, how, how is that possible? It's because of our incompetence as developers, of having everything coupled. So that's what we mean by well-crafted, like a system that I can just press a button and have the whole thing tested, easy to change. So that's what we want. It's suddenly adding value is another one that is misunderstood. This is not about adding new features or fixing a bug. Uh, as I said, I work for a very large organization, but even for some of you that may be working on a smaller organization, just in salary in a year, in machines, communication work, infrastructure, blah, blah. Do you know how much it costs to run a software project? We run a few millions just to pay salaries for one or two of our projects. We have hundreds of them. Do you know how much it costs to run a software project? So a lot of people say, oh, is it an asset or not? I don't care. The, the, the thing is about the return on investment. Someone is putting a lot of money in these software projects. And then when they want to, after three years, five years, when they want their return back, the software is so shit, like so shit, that at the beginning it took like two days to, to build a feature. The same, a feature of the same size two years later takes two months. It gets to a point that is so unstable, so shit, so complicated, that what they do, so let's decommission that. At that moment where they would get their return on investment on that software, where they could shrink the teams and just keep the thing they're making money for them or saving money for them or keeping their revenue. Uh, so they need to write a brand new one. And they will write a brand new one that is as shit as the previous one and that will also be decommissioned in five years' time. So that's what we mean, that setting a new value is not to allow that to happen. So every time that we work with the software, we prepare our software to accept changes for a very, very long time. So a community of professionals, uh, that's something that's at the heart of craftsmanship as well. So what we want, we, we feel that is our, uh, we need to take responsibility. We, we are responsible for change in our industry. So we want to share ideas, doing what we're doing here today, but mainly on the, the, during the talks sharing ideas, learning with each other, mentoring people. And the most important thing is the productive partnership that people, that's why I get angry when people say, oh, you just focus on the code. They don't, just read the bloody thing, right? So basically, uh, we don't believe, or at least I don't believe, in em employer-employee sort of relationship. Uh, I'm a current employee now, uh, but I was a consultant before, and I was a contractor before. And for me, that's a mere detail. That's just the, the paperwork that we have in how I'm going to get paid and which benefits I'm going to have. But the attitude towards my client, that is the, people, the person paying me or the company paying me, should be the same. It should be professional. We should be there to help them. There's no such a thing. So it should be a partnership. So regardless how, in which format you are paid. And, and people talk a lot about stakeholders. I chose to be a developer for the rest of my life. That was my choice when I was a teenager. And so when people talk about stake stakeholders, I feel that I am one of the stakeholders in the project. And the reason that I say that is because at stake for me is my career, is my own reputation. And I don't want to be in a series of failed projects because of stupidity. So I will do whatever I can to make the project success, because it's my career, it's my reputation. And there were situations where uh, some people 
Some companies, they were not prepared for that. You as a developer, you go there and try to help them. The same way that many of you, Agile Codes and Lean Codes, you try to speak to, 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 to the senior management. But sometimes as a developer, they don't listen to you. They say, no, no, we have smarter people here to think about that. You try a little bit, but there is one thing that you can do in this situation. Leave the fucking company. Find a better job to work. Right? Find a better place. Don't try to help who doesn't want to be helped. Don't be miserable in a place where no one respects your opinion. There are loads of companies out there crying for good developers. Crying. Just leave the bloody place. So, this is one of, if I had to define craftsmanship, it's not exactly a definition, but this is a, a way that I like to talk about craftsmanship. And if I had to choose one word to define what craftsmanship means, for me it's professionalism. That's how I see craftsmanship, as professionalism in software development. In software development. And, and a lot of people will say, yeah, yeah, it's so nice and good, but you don't know my context. You don't know my company. You don't know my boss. Right? He's a monster with two heads. And yeah, I don't know your company, I don't know your boss, I don't, I don't have a sword to cut the, the heads out. So, but I believe that in the majority of the contexts, people paying for the software that we are producing, they are interested to keep the velocity as we go along. So two years later, they want to be as fast as they were when we started the project. They want quality. They want the clients to be happy. They don't want to see stupid bugs on the, or even serious bugs. They don't want you to lose money. They want a return for their investment. That's common. That's not context dependent. And I see a lot of overlaps between agile and craftsmanship. And, and I think that uh, agile processes, uh, they, they shine in terms of giving a feedback loop, in terms of if we are building the right thing. And we are constantly talking about this feedback loop, like a short and quick feedback loop on the process, knowing what we are doing, all this kind of good stuff. Um, but how do we get that in a software? Because I want the same thing. When I'm writing my software, I want to have the same quick feedback. It's awesome to have the whole Kanban, the whole Scrum, all these methodologies that are fantastic in giving you feedback. But how do we do that in terms of code? And that's where I think that craftsmanship shines. But there is a difference in there. How many of you have seen this before? A few hands. Just over half. So this has been around for more than 15 years. And if you look at the, the, the practices uh, in the inner circles, they're not context dependent at all. You don't need to have a special context to use any of them. This is just how you go about building good software. One important distinction is that they are practices. They are not craftsmanship. They are practices that we currently advocate because of the value that they bring us. And when we talk about value, and that's uh, Another uh, lean people love to talk about value. They feel there must be value, right? So, so, and then, but people struggle to, to say the same thing in technical practices. A question that we get all the time is, how do I have my, how do I make my team to adopt TDD? How do I make my manager mainly like to, to buy this idea? And like, talk about the value that these practices give. Like, wouldn't it be nice? Th think about that. Wouldn't it be nice to click a button and then after two, three, five minutes, you are confident that your system works. Wouldn't it be nice? That's value. That's feedback loop. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you had a practice that can help us focus in small increments and give us instant feedback as we start progressing with our code? We are constantly getting a feedback if it's right or wrong. Wouldn't it be nice? That's feedback loop. That's value. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, a feedback on our design if our system is decoupled, if it's easy to maintain? Uh, because like every time that you try to add a new feature, loads of things break. And so, break. so wouldn't it be nice to have this confidence? Wouldn't it be nice to have some documentation, executable documentation? Oh, by the way, we have one. We have TDD. So wouldn't it be nice to, if it, it worked, uh, wouldn't it be nice to, when I'm writing my code, Immediately, someone says, what is this? I don't understand that. So, wh what are, why don't you do like that? Why don't you reuse that thing? Wouldn't it be nice? We can pair. So, wouldn't it be nice when we have a lot of people working in the project? It doesn't need to be a lot. It's been before. It may be, I don't know, 70. 
in a few countries. Wouldn't it be nice that every time that one person commits a piece of code, we are immediately, and I say immediately like two, three minutes, five minutes, notified that something was added in the system, the system is still working, or the system is broken. That's continuous integration. So when you talk about these things with your managers and whoever manage, uh, is responsible for the project, don't talk about the practices themselves. Talk about the value that they bring to you. And once again, like the way I see it, because there's a lot of confusion is what is Crossmanship? Is Crossmanship just XP rebranded? The answer is no. Crossmanship is all about an attitude, an ideology, a, a, life, a, a lifestyle. But there are practices that we advocate because we write code and we need to have practices. And currently, those are the practices that we advocate, but I'm happy to throw, to throw them, all of them away. Like, if you don't do one of them, tell me what you do instead. Tell me what you do instead that gives me more value than that. Because as soon as someone figures that out, I'm going to throw all this shit away and I'm going to use something that is better for me. So it's not XP rebranded. It's just what we consider at the moment today. Maybe we'll change tomorrow, maybe in 10 years' time, as soon as we find something that gives us more value and a shorter feedback loop. That's as simple as that. Software Cosmoship is all about attitude. Pavel was asking about, if you're hiring someone, what sort of people would you look for? We hire a lot in many countries, and we changed our entire recruitment process. And at the very, very top, the most important thing that we look for is called passion. I don't care about which technologies, I don't care about what they do, I care, are they passionate about software development? Because if they are, I can work with them. If they are not, I cannot do anything. So, in terms of the software craftsmanship attitude, it's about passion, it's about being pr proud of what you do. It's, it's like, I feel happy when someone uses the code that we produced as a team and people are using that and say, so, wow, that's really cool. It's helping our company, it's helping our business. I feel proud about that. So only in our careers, I, I see loads of developers and yeah, my company shit. So why is that? Never paid me a training course. Never sent me to a conference. And I asked them, it's like, that they never, uh, they always put me in shit projects, never in, in uh, latest technologies projects and stuff. So, like, imagine you have a doctor or a dentist. Your tooth is your, your tooth is aching. You go to your dentist, and then you open your mouth, ah, and then the dentist look at your mouth and say like, yeah, my tooth is aching. And then the dentist look at you and say, hmm, can you buy me a book? Can you imagine that? Imagine your plumber fixing your your, your plumbing stuff. Your sink that is, and they ask, can you send me to a conference? Can you buy me a book? Would you do that? And imagine that you are so crazy that you say, okay, I'm taking all the people that uh, provide service to me, from plumbers, from doctors, from, from builders, from whoever, and I'm going to pay training for every one of them. And then you pay, and then they come back with the knowledge that you paid, and they charge you. How do you feel about that? Isn't it awesome? But we do that as developers. So how on earth can we be called professionals if that's how we behave? It's our responsibility to own our careers, to buy your own books, to study in your personal time. If the company does that, awesome. It stay there because it's a great company. But it's not their obligation. So practice. We don't pay people to practice. I don't, unless it's for a groupie, I don't want to see the bands that I like practicing. I want just to go to the concert and watch them. So that's why, because certain practices are hard to, to do. So of course we will learn a lot at work, but I can provide more value if I learn myself. It's much easier for me to drive technical change in my company if I am comfortable with the practices that I want to put. And to be comfortable, I need to take my own time as a professional to learn them, and then I can go there and help them. And then the Boy Scout rule, that is a, a, a rule that I take to my personal life as well. Like always make, uh, leave the campground cleaner than you found it. So make things better. If you need to do something, leave it in a better shape. That's it. You don't need to change everything. Just a little bit. Just a little bit better. So another thing that is important is software craftsmanship is not a church. 
right? That's your career. You decide where you want to go. We don't, we're not trying to recruit anyone. I'm not trying to put software craftsmanship coaches, uh, God forbid, that we have one day, someone is a craftsmanship coach. Uh, coach. Uh, so it's basically like showing, lead by example, being a mentor. So it's not about, about beautiful code, it's just trying to provide value, not writing crap code to your customers. And of course that we know that craftsmanship on its own is not enough. Nothing is enough. Lean is not enough. Combined, like agile, nothing is enough. Because like someone farts in Asia, the, the market in Europe crashes, and then everything is pointless, <laughs> right? So nothing is enough. So, but one thing I'm sure, that the lack of craftsmanship can be one of the uh, main causes of, of, of a, failing, a failing project. So, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> so, how many of you started coding when you were very young, like 10, 11, 15? How many of you, okay. How many of you were coding uh, before university? Awesome, see? The majority of you were coding even before university. So, I started when I was 11, joined university 17, left university 21. 10 years coding when I was 21. Very similar to many of you. The problem is that when you have youth and knowledge, quite often it leads to arrogance. Think about someone extremely arrogant. I was far worse. Oh boy, I was fucking arrogant. Jeez, I, I can't even uh, stand myself. Like, so, but, so then, so I left university, had a few jobs during university, and there was this big company uh, in Brazil. Back then I was I'm Brazilian, so I was living in Brazil. And so this big international company, they, they opened a, a selection process. There were like 900 people applying for that. They would hire 60. It was a very length pros, uh, process with like tests and you had to go there for two weeks and to learn stuff. It would be test on that uh, group dynamics. So it was a complex uh, thing. I had to, to resign my previous job to, to go there. They ended up hiring 32 instead of 60. And guess who was hired? Yeah. Fucking awesome, right? So I was awesome. And then when I joined that, and after three months, I kept hearing about this team and this guy. So there was this architectural team where they, the, their clients were the other teams. They were providing infrastructure to them, but they were considered the best team in the company. And, and the, the, the manager, like everyone, everyone was talking about him. Was like He was awesome, like fantastic developer. Look at me, I had to work there, right? So I did, I said, I need to work there. That's my place. So one day, I, I found him uh, having a coffee, right? And I was, deep breath, walks it down. Hi, I'm Sandra. Uh, I want to work for you. And I said, oh, hey. I said, yeah, yeah, I heard about your team, I heard about you, I would like to work for you. I don't care, I just want to work for you. And then he spent like half an hour talking to me. The, the majority of the thing that he was asking me, what about when I started coding, how much time I spent coding, uh, what I do outside working hours, so things that I like, he didn't ask me a single technical question, single. I never understood that. Though it took me a while to understand that what he was doing was measuring my passion for what I do. That's what he was doing. So I joined the team. I'm running out of time, so I need you to cut short. So there was, after a few weeks, some negotiations, blah, 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 I joined his team. Monday morning, first day, I was there. And, and then he came along, uh, gave me some tasks to do. And I said, okay, so he explained what I had to do and asked him, how long do, uh, do I have to, to, to finish that? I said, well, you know what, Monday, Friday I come by, uh, just, just uh, to see where you are. That was back in the late 90s, right? So it was a long time, even before a giant cross machine, all this kind of stuff. So, that was my chance, right? So that day, I was working until like almost midnight, like crazy, blah, 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 blah. And then got in the office on Tuesday, seven o'clock in the morning, blah, blah, blah. two o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, just ran into his office. Boss, I'm finished, I'm done. And by the way, it's working. He was typing. So I, I feel some redundancy in there. You said that you were done, so I assumed that it's working because that's why you were paid for. And that was my, 
the first slap in my face. I said, well, but he was God, right? So I said, well, that's all right. That's okay, he's having a bad day, but it doesn't matter. So and then he said, okay, cool, awesome, so sit down. I was working with Delphi. I don't know if you know what Delphi is or Delphi. So, so it was object language uh, in the 90s. Had a, an, a beautiful IDE way ahead of its time. So I had my code committed into a repository. He, he got the code and opened on VI. I said, what the hell is he doing? So he opened my 200 line file on VI with that amazing IDE that Borland had. So what the fuck is that? So anyway, so he, he was going line by line, and then he was asking me, can you see this? What, what is this? And so, oh yeah, this is a very clever code, because that's how senior people were. Like you were considered a senior in the 90s, if you could write something that no one can understand, <laughs> right? And I made sure of it, right? So, <laughs> so and he was looking like, what the fuck is that? Right? So, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then he said, how would you feel? We have a very large code base. How would you feel? It's just your second day here. To get a piece of code with no context, that there is a bug in there you need to find, and if the whole code was written like that. How respectful do you think that this is? And then he kept going. I said, like, can you see here? There's duplication. I said, no, no, there's no duplication. There's a slight No, this structure is duplicated. If you think a little bit about it, you can remove that. Can you see these uh, eight lines of code? If you think a little bit about it, could you make it smaller? Yeah, I could, probably three lines if you use, yeah. Okay, cool. Can you see this try catch here? Yeah, do you know how heap and stack work? Do you know how expensive these instructions? He, in summary, he destroyed my code. 200 lines, destroyed it. I had no arguments. And then, worst of all, he asked me, did you understand everything that I said? I said, yes. Would you be able to do it again properly now that you know? Yeah, do you disagree? So, he deleted the fucking code. <laughs> and then he said, like, now you go in there and do it again. You still have until Friday. I was furious. And then I just left. And then I, when I was leaving the room, he called me and said, Sandra. And then he said this. How it's done is as important as having it done. This was said like more than 12 years ago. I don't know, no, 15 years ago. I never forgot about that. Today in the, the craftsmanship community in London, that's our uh, slogan. I use that in my t-shirts. So I was furious. I went downstairs. I had probably 40 cigarettes, one after another. I wanted to kill someone. I wanted to kill him first, and then kill the rest of the company. And I was like, who the fuck does, does he think he is to speak to me like that? I'm very good. He can't speak to me like that. I'm not working for this guy. I don't need this crap. I want to leave this company. And then I came down, and for the first time in my life, I realized that someone took the time to teach me how to be good, to teach me how to respect my colleagues. For two years, he, took, he taught me respect. He taught me how to care about what I do, to be proud about what I do to satisfy my customers, to produce something that we are proud of. That's what software craftsmanship means to me. Many of you, I'm sure, that didn't have an opportunity to work with a person like that, that changed, how, changed my life, not just as a professional, but as a person. We cannot change that, we cannot go back in time, because you won't have this person early on in their career but you can give this opportunity to someone. So mentor people, share what you know, share your ideas. Thank you very much.